Okay. I want to welcome everyone to, the, to this week's uh, news conference on COVID-19. Again, we've been holding these news conferences every Friday at 1 o'clock for the past several weeks. And it's our opportunity to have our local public health officials talk about the situation of the, of the virus in terms of our community, not New York, uh, a little bit of South Carolina, uh, but mainly right here in the upstate, particularly Greenville, South Carolina. So we do have with us today, as usual, Dr. Eric Osmond of Prisma and Dr. Marcus Blackstone of Bonsa Coors and they'll have the latest information on where things stand in, in terms of the spread of the virus and what they're seeing at those hospitals. We also have Dr. Brandon uh, Traxler with us again from DHEC who will give us some statewide perspective including on the very important uh, subject of testing and tracing in, in that emerging area for the state of South Carolina and that's a very serious effort and DHEC has a lot of new things I think to say to say about that. And we have Jay Merritt with us every week. We appreciate that with the county, Greenville County Emergency Management Association. So today um, is a little bit different as we're sticking to our, our professionals who are with us every week. We normally have uh, some additional guests, but we're not, we're cutting this one a little more short today, a little shorter today, and to focus on, uh, on, the, on the, what we're seeing in the terms of the data. Uh, first up though, I do wanna make a few announcements very briefly, some changes in the city. Uh, as we know, statewide, you're seeing more, more openings, and particularly for restaurants in terms of outside dining, and you're seeing that across the state and indeed across the country. And just as a reminder that uh, while we have these openings, social distancing is still the overriding paramount concern, and we want to continue to emphasize the importance of that. Uh, good, good to know that the uh, restaurants in in Greenville have been uh, working on this for some time through the South Carolina Restaurant Association. They have protocols and guidelines in place and that's very, very good to know. They're taking it very seriously. Uh, we've been out in touch with, with our restaurant owners here in, um, in Greenville to make sure they, they're feeling good about it. And in some areas like in downtown Greenville, we've actually contacted every single restaurant to talk about uh, what they plan to do. And in particular, what do they need? If they need some additional space for outside dining, we've worked uh, we've worked it out with every single uh, individual restaurant owner. So we're trying to be very flexible, very creative and innovative, and, and above all, you know, working, working with these small business people to make them successful. At the same time, making sure that we have a safe environment, not only in the restaurants, but all over the downtown area. And that's an ongoing process. We're, all, we're kind of learning as we go along on this, but uh, it, it will continue this weekend. So this weekend is very important that people social distance as things begin to open. The two go together. And a good announcement here, uh, Falls Park will be reopened uh, at, uh, be at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Of course, again, we have, a, we have at least one restaurant in Falls Park, so that's, uh, that's important to note as well. But Falls Park will be open. The Swamp River Trail is already open, and Cleveland Park is open. So our parks are mainly have indeed reopened in the city of Greenville. We had a number of them that never did close, but some of the downtown parks were closed at one time. So Falls Park reopens, Cleveland Park's already open, Trail's already open as well. Uh, but we'll have a you know, good bit of eyes and ears on the parks and listening out to hear what people are saying and, and if there are any concerns uh, in the downtown area. And also just uh, observing people's activities. And if we have to make some changes in terms of how we manage Falls Park, we'll. We'll take a look at that during the weekend and adjust accordingly. So those are some good announcements to be able to make. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Eric Osmond of Prisma, who's uh, always with us, and we appreciate that, Dr. Osmond, to give us the latest information on what we're seeing in Greenville. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So th this week in Greenville, uh, the, the numbers within the Prisma Health System have been, been relatively stable. Again, this is the third week where our numbers are fairly flat, meaning you know, we certainly have day-to-day -day undulation and slight ups and downs, but overall the trend uh, remains about the same. We're not seeing any dramatic increases at this point. 
from the standpoint of the hospital, our capacity remains uh, good. We are starting to return to almost full operating uh, capabilities as far as our procedures and surgeries, which is really important. We've had a number of people that had to wait uh, several weeks to get critical procedures and surgeries done. Uh, we're starting to move through that backlog of cases and uh, get those procedures completed. From the standpoint of testing, we, we have uh, opened up community testing in conjunction with DHEC and the Army National Guard. Uh, we've completed four sites so far in both the upstate and Greenville and have had tremendous turnout uh, at all sites. And through that testing, have found a positivity rate of around 6%. So um, I, I think in some ways that, that number is very reassuring in, in that, as we, we've discussed before, what we really want to do in South Carolina is get that positivity rate down as low as possible, meaning we're doing appropriate levels of testing. Uh, we still do have the drive-through testing available at uh, the hospital, both here in Greenville at Memorial and then at Columbia at Richland that, that is available, and we are still actively testing through that. From the standpoint of PPE, uh, we, we have a very adequate supply of personal protective equipment um, in the health system, and that's one of the reasons we have been able to restart many of the procedures and surgeries that were delayed. And, and so overall, um, we feel pretty good about where we're at right now. Um, we, we feel good about the community testing that's going on. The one thing I do want to encourage people to remember is that this is still a very, very dangerous disease in, in that, you know, suppressing this disease in the community is going to require everyone paying attention to social distancing and many of the things that we've been talking about for the last several weeks. So even as things open up and as exciting uh, and, and great as that is for this wonderful community we live in, we have to be very cautious and remember social distancing and make sure that we stay safe uh, during this period where we're sort of moving from peak uh, impact of the disease to a period that is more going to be a containment phase. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Marcus Blackstone uh, from Bond Scores to give their report. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Osman. So uh, at Bon Secours, uh, real similar to what Dr. Osman just talked about at Prisma, you know, we, we saw a little bump in the last two days, um, but it was small. Um, before then, as I said last Friday, we had actually flattened out um, and it really slowed down. We'll just watch it close um, to make sure there's not anything to it. Um, you know, we talk to Prisma on a regular basis to compare notes, not, not just about who we're seeing, but what populations you know, that we're seeing. So the same thing, we're good on uh, PPE uh, in our system. Um, we're now in our second week of adding back elective surgeries. Um, the outpatient Wednesday a week ago has gone well. We added surgeries back at our East Side Hospital this Wednesday. So we're trying to ramp that capacity back up um, and that, that's all going well. I think from my standpoint, Today, uh, you know, just to really emphasize from a healthcare standpoint, you know, we really need everybody to do their part around um, the aspects that we've talked about for weeks now to, you know, to try to contain um, the COVID-19. Uh, it is a very serious illness. I mean, you know, people still die every day from it. And so things like wearing masks when you're in groups or you're in stores, you know, make a huge difference uh, from that standpoint. The social distancing is absolutely imperative, uh, and we've talked about that before. The other thing that I'll touch on, and Dr. Traxler may touch on as well, the CDC actually put out guidance around gloves. You see a lot of people wear gloves, and you know, there's actually a thought that they may act, that actually may be worse if you don't wear them appropriately. If you look at what we do in healthcare, if you watch us put on a pair of gloves, whether we're in an exam room or in a hospital, we always take those gloves off when we leave the room. Because if you don't, if you handle things and you don't take the gloves off properly, number one, dispose of them, number two, you can actually increase your risk, um, you know, you know, of basically, um, you know, spreading germs, spreading viruses and that. So I would just be, you know, I would be real, you know, diligent about hand washing, 
Um, you know, you really can't wash gloves, but you can wash your hands all the time. You can use hand sanitizers. So that's really, you know, for today's, you know, today's press conference, that's really what I wanted to stress, you know, from a health care standpoint is, you know, we ask that you do your part to help limit um, the spread um, since we are in a position where it has gone down. We are starting to basically, you know, open everything back up. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Traxler. Good afternoon. And yes, I'm going to talk some, I think, about testing today. Um, as our response to this pandemic continues, DHEC is still focused on protecting the health and safety of all people. And through that, we have developed a statewide testing program that's going to increase testing in the state and help us to have a better understanding of the prevalence of infection with COVID-19 in South Carolina. Testing uh, helps us to quickly identify those hot spots, catch outbreaks before they spread, and also tells us where resources might uh, most be needed. As of yesterday, a total of 73,442 tests have been performed in South Carolina. And of those tests, 7,142 were positive. So that gives the positivity rate, as Dr. Osmond was talking about, of just under 10%. And that is a number that we are looking at as, these te as this testing goes up. We do expect to see increases in number of daily case counts, but we hope to see a decreasing in that positivity rate. Increased testing is also going to provide us results that will help guide more precise public health interventions and that will allow us to transition safely into reopening and restoring the strong economy. And to assist us with this, the federal government has committed to uh, provide DHEC with enough supplies to test 2% of the population in the state for May and for June. So therefore, our goal is to test about 110 South Carolinians per month for the next couple of months uh, using this testing plan. And it has four key components. Uh, one is the universal testing of all nursing home uh, residents and staff. The next is expanding testing in those under-resourced minority and rural communities. And then conducting mass testing in urban areas, which would include Greenville. And lastly, finding testing sites to perform this. When we look at nursing homes, roughly 40,000 South Carolinians either live or work in one of 194 nursing homes in the state. And protective measures have been put in place, including the governor's executive order back on March 13th that stopped public visitation to these types of facilities. But the number of infections among the staff and residents in long-term care facilities continues to grow. Unfortunately, the number of deaths also among long-term care facility residents is growing. As of yesterday, there have been 851 cases reported in these facilities, which is about 12% of all of our South Carolina cases. Meanwhile, there have been 84 deaths in these facilities, which represents 28% of all who have died from COVID-19 associated reasons in our state. DHEC is going to be contest conducting testing of the 40,000 nursing home residents and staff in the state. We'll also be increasing testing in other congregate facilities, such as prisons, jails, or group homes. And as we enhance our testing cap uh, capacity at these congregate facilities, we also recognize the importance of increasing testing access across the state, especially at those for those who are at greatest risk of the severe illness from the disease. As we discussed here in this setting last week, African American and other minority populations have been disproportionately impacted by this virus with a higher per capita rates of serious illness and death than white populations. Likewise, our rural counties account for nine out of the top, nine out of the 10 top counties for infection rates per capita in South Carolina. So we're gonna be increasing testing in these communities using mobile testing sites, community paramedicine, and community healthcare and retail partners. We'll be partnering with the governor's office, the South Carolina legislature, the South Carolina Hospital Association, local hospitals such as we've done here in Greenville, local business and, uh, businesses and others to conduct these mobile testing sites. Looking at urban areas, these areas are concerning because of their size, the population density, and the access to many uh, social venues where people like to congregate. These areas are also, in our hub, also our hubs of tourism and commerce. And Greenville is a wonderful example of that as we welcome many visitors, both domestic and international, here every year. DHEC is going to be working with various partners to host some pop-up testing events at multiple locations each month 
in the Greenville Spartanburg area as well as Charleston and Columbia areas. We are providing the public with up-to-date locations of COVID-19 test sampling sites, including these mobile and pop-up clinics. Our DHEC COVID-19 webpage has a link on the right-hand sidebar at the top uh, that'll take you and you can look by county at what's available and see them on a map. And additionally, as I was walking out to come here, our contact tracing webpage went live. I received notification for that. Uh, it includes information for the public about contact tracing. And at the bottom, there's a link to a form that people can fill out if they're interested in volunteering to help as a contact tracer. And that website is uh, scdhec.gov backslash COVID-19 dash dash contact dash tracing. Um, but I'm sure it's also linked off of our main co uh, DHEC COVID-19 webpage as well. And with that, I want to introduce Jay Merritt, the Greenville County Emergency Manager. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Traxler. Thanks for having us again, Mr. Mayor. Um, as of the end of the business yesterday, May 7th, uh, we were notified in Greenville County of 36 additional cases yesterday. Uh, that brings the total cases to Greenville County to 835. Um, as of test, out of this close of business yesterday with testing at the first responder medical staff testing site, we've administered 571 tests with 70 of those being positive. Uh, as of 4.45 p.m. yesterday also, we've received 244 resource requests, 174 of which have been completed. And as, we, as always, those are being filled by our office, uh, South Carolina Emergency Management Division, DHEC, and uh, as well as some private sector individuals. Uh, this week, we're still uh, helping our citizens with some of the recovery from the tornadoes that we've experienced over the last several weeks. And uh, fortunately, we've had a little bit of break in that weather. So with that, that is all I have to report today. Okay. <clears throat> I want to amplify a little bit about the uh, comments by our representative from DHEC, uh, Dr. Traxler. The, uh, the state effort on testing and tracing is, is quite serious. and I had a chance to be, be briefed on this a little bit further. It looks like we're going to have a very comprehensive and robust plan in South Carolina, and that's a good thing. I think we're all asking those questions, and you again hear about this issue nationally. It looks like some people are taking this very seriously at, D, at DHEC and expanded program. And it's true, we're going to need a lot of people uh, in this, this, this aspect of tracing. And um, that's important on many levels, uh, but one particular, one side part of this whole thing about um, about testing and tracing is that as we look ahead and months ahead where you may indeed have a recurrence it's extremely important to have what you might call an early warning system in place uh, to detect early in the process any kind of recurrence to be able to respond to that so you know those states that have a robust system of tracing indeed testing and tracing are, are going to be the states that can catch it the quickest and that's extremely important and i would predict in the months ahead that's going to become a big a big issue and, and some states will do it well and some states will not. I, I believe we're going to do it correct in South Carolina. I, I'm glad you gave the uh, website for anyone who wanted to volunteer as a, uh, a tracer. Um, I think there'll be a lot of positions and I also saw the numbers of the um, number of people who um, who are part of that process now as opposed to a couple weeks ago and there's a dramatic increase. Many, I guess thousands of people have, uh, have signed up for that. Would be. I believe that'd be correct, um, but we're going to need a lot more people, and it's a good opportunity for for people who, who are concerned about this to to be a part of it. Um, so I appreciate your your background on that. I think we'll be hearing a lot more about that soon. Questions for the uh, medical community? Just Mayor, could you um, elaborate on the opening of the park and the trails? I mean, this gives the impression to some people who maybe are really excited to get outside that life can go back to yeah. normal. But can you talk about things that people who do want to use the park and the trails in the coming days and weeks should still be doing if they go and do that and the things that they shouldn't be doing? Right. Well, certainly the weather uh, will be nice this weekend, a little bit warmer than it is today. And we saw early signs this week of a larger number of people as they get out with, with uh, some of the restaurants with, uh, with outside dining. So it's a, it's a time of extra vigilance. Uh, we need to make sure, again, for outside dining purposes, that restaurants have plenty of room to spread out uh, to be, so people be comfortable uh, going to those restaurants. 
and uh, and really for the whole downtown area. So just to reiterate that social distancing is extremely important and everything we should do should be looking first and foremost at that, that we provide open spaces. And that's another reason why the parks are open, frankly. We don't need people crowding in one place. We need multiple locations. So I think it'll be a good and healthy thing to have more opportunities for people to get outside and have recreation and feel like they're in an open area. And by the way, on that, uh, you may have noticed in the news this week, there have been a number of stories. Uh, you know, we learn, everybody's learning about this virus uh, as you go along. Uh, this week, there are a number of stories about the importance of being outside, that outside might be the safest place to be. You're less likely to spread the germs as opposed to being inside. So it's a good thing. Yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, I've got a couple of questions for you and then a couple for the health officials, if okay. that's okay. If yeah. anybody wants to jump in, I'll move out of the way for turns. <laughs> um, Jane Revelo, WIFF4. Um, May is such a great month for festivals in downtown Greenville. We're missing Artisphere. We're missing the Greek festivals, others. What kind of financial hit do you anticipate just as a result of that income not coming in from the festivals? Well, each festival uh, has its own budget and standalone organizations we work with. Uh, I, I, I believe most of them are in pretty good shape. Uh, Artisphere is looking at rescheduling Artisphere. We'll see. I hope that can happen. I believe it will. In some, it'll be changed, obviously, the way it's spread out. But uh, uh, I, I think it'd be fair to say they have a strong budget year-round. Uh, so I think they'll do fine. I don't. I haven't heard back from from too many of the others. We are working, by the way, to uh, we're working toward reopening the Saturday farmers market. Again, it will not look exactly the way it has in the past, but we've our staff is hard at work on that, and they think they've found a way to reopen the market uh, in a couple of weeks. Great, within a couple yeah. of weeks. So I was thinking about festivals just attract so many people and then just tax them. Oh, the come. larger economic impact. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I was thinking of their budgets because that's what we work yeah. with all the time. Uh, well, there's no question about that, yeah. And that, um, that reflects back on hotel occupancy and, of course, the people in restaurants and shops and stores. So there's no doubt there's, there's been a big hit on that. Yeah. And yesterday we covered the opening of a small store right on Main Street, but yeah. kind of nice as we report people being furloughed and some businesses having to close. It was really refreshing that a yes. brand new business opened in downtown. Glad to see that on, 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 in the media and on Channel 4 as well. And uh, yeah, we actually had a new retailer open on Main Street on Wednesday or Thursday. That's, that's news in itself. And uh, they had made arrangements ahead of time, but they surged, surged ahead with that. And I think that's fantastic. Um, some confidence in the future. And they, they're retailers who are, have a number of shops in different cities, so they know what they're doing, and uh, they're quite confident. So we have, while we'll have some closings, we may indeed have some openings. And, and to tell you the truth, we have a number of economic projects, economic development projects that are kind of in the pipeline, and I'm glad to say they're still in the pipeline. They're still coming through. So we'll have some uh, confidence boosters, if you will, in the next couple weeks and months. Good. That's encouraging. Yeah. I've got a question for Dr. Traxler. Okay. Are, are, is DHEC ready to say that we're through the surge? We, we hear uh, Prisma and, and Bon Secours say that they've kind of been flat for three weeks. These numbers are tracking along exactly as Dr. Bell had predicted six or eight weeks ago. Is the surge over in South Carolina? I think that I'm, we're cautiously optimistic that we are doing that flattening. And, of course, every day that we see that continued flattening um, is more encouraging. Uh, we want, of course, to see it go down, um, but we also, as things open, want to see it not increase. So um, we remain prepared and continuing to work on preparations in case the cases were to go back up. But um, I think at this point, it, we're cautiously optimistic. If people keep doing what they have been doing, that's the big key to us, uh, to us keeping that curve flat, is, uh, is doing that social distancing, wearing your masks, washing your hands, and using hand sanitizer. So. Could you elaborate, too, on something that the mayor said, that the states that do really aggressive testing will be the ones that are able to move forward? Can you kind of add a medical component to why that's, in fact, the case? Sure. So as we increase testing, um, we hope to capture a larger percentage, or, you know, and ideally all of the people who are infected, who are contagious. And so um, as we do that and we gain confidence that we're doing that and people, we ask those people in their close contacts to stay at home during the period of time they could, could infect someone else, that then gives us more, I think, more of a little bit of a sense of security 
in terms of knowing where these hot spots are, where cases are, um, and what, what really the prevalence is out there. Excellent. Um, and then I'm not sure who wants this, Dr. Blackstone or Dr. Osman, but I'm uh, encouraged by what you all both have been doing with convalescent plasma and through the blood connection. Um, how is that going? Are we seeing patients in the upstate now treated with convalescent plasma? And is there any plan to maybe give convalescent plasma to those frontline medical workers who do see a higher viral load potentially? So, so Jay, you know, the uh, convalescent plasma program at Prisma is going well, and we have treated a number of patients, and, and, and I think we have seen some positive results. So that's, that, that's very reassuring. You know, from the standpoint of the viral load for the frontline medical workers, I think, I think early in the disease course, um, you saw a number of medical workers that were exposed. They had very high viral load exposures. And, and in those situations, maybe appropriately so, you would require prophylaxis. But, you know, what we're seeing now is our staff has, has a very good familiarity with treating this disease. They, they're very comfortable with the PPE. There's plenty of PPE. We've got a lot of precautions in place, and we've seen very, very few infections amongst our staff. So, so while that might be a totally appropriate use for it, fortunately, we don't see that as a need right now. And I'll you know, let Dr. Blackstone comment on what, what they're seeing at uh, Bon Secours. Fantastic. Thank you. So we've treated two patients total who seem to be doing well from that standpoint. Same thing Eric said, as far as our staff goes, you know, it, this has really become their day and using PPE. We've had a very, very, very low exposure rate with our employees. So we really have not had that employee who is really sick from the front lines to be able to do that. Uh, the only one I, that I'll add to it is the blood connection I actually just came out in the last day or so and backed up, you know, initially for donors, it was 28 days post symptoms. They've actually backed that up to 14 for donors. So I think that's important for people to know uh, for them, for their standpoint. And one more thing while you're there. Thank you, Dr. Blackstone. We were just talking in the media about um, we want to make sure that we get the message out that you all are trying to convey today. And that is as we move forward, wear the mask, keep doing the procedures with hand washing, hand sanitizing, social distancing. Not really sure that people are getting the message on masks. Can you, masks are not necessarily to protect the person wearing the mask, unless you have an N95. They're to protect the people around you, right? Can you ex right. explain that to us, as, as Denzel Washington would say, like I'm in third grade? So we know this is a, you know, this is a disease spread by droplets. So you wear the mask to actually to protect others around you, you know, but at the same time, if you have a mask on, it goes both ways. So if you have a mask on and you're somebody that doesn't have a mask and coughs or sneezes, your chance of inhaling that goes down, you know, significantly from that standpoint. So it's really both, and to your point, I don't mind saying, you know, I had to go in Lowe's the other day and there were no masks. I walked in and everybody's looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, and even employees, I mean, I think it's really employee for employees as we open back up, I mean, you know, you see the plexiglass shields, you know, people are doing that in drive throughs they're doing it at checkouts. But employees really need to be wearing masks from that standpoint to protect themselves in the same way because you know, it goes back to that asymptomatic, you know, COVID positive patient that Dr. Traxler knows are talking about with testing to be able to identify the positives so that we can get to them, educate them, quarantine them from that standpoint. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Welcome. He was picking on me about that. You were late. <laughs> I forgot my mask. Yeah. I didn't want to be that guy. No. Um, no. So when you talk about uh, opening up Falls Park and the need for social distancing, um, what's, what's the tolerance level on that in terms of how do you judge whether people are appropriately doing it? I mean, is this something that... Uh, it could be quickly shut back down. Um, what type of enforcement do you have for that, et cetera? I would just basically say that I think the best test of uh, 
uh, whether our open parks is a, is a good idea or not is whether people are moving. Uh, the best thing people can do is to keep moving, keep moving along, and stay on the trails. Uh, we're not encouraging people to stay on the benches or to have picnics in the park or anything like that. There, there could be some of that, I suppose, if they're spread out, but we'd like people to continue to move on. I think we're still having discussion, from what I'm seeing in my notes here from our city parks department, still having discussion on whether the Liberty Bridge will be opened or not. I really thought it, I assumed it would be, but I see here that it says it will remain closed. So I guess that's a point of some discussion. Um, if people continue to move along, I think it'll be fine. But I think that's the best best way to, to know whether we're succeeding or not. So uh, last week you talked about um, using Main Street to help with restaurants and mm -hmm. seating. Is what you're doing to allow for more pedestrian use on the street designed to help restaurants move their operations right. while they're out. What do you, how is, what's the follow-up on that? You know, it's still kind of a work in progress. I had my personal feeling about it, which is I think we should take a block of Main Street at least and, and have more of a plaza so people can have a sense of openness. Uh, right now we're looking at, uh, number one, we talk to every restaurant about kind of what do they need. If they need an extra four or five tables, how we can spread them out to make them safe and comfortable for everyone, safe and comfortable. And uh, so that was kind of job one. Job two is to then look at the sidewalks themselves and whether we can expand the sidewalk section, take away the parking, for example. That's, a, that's one thing we do a lot of, and so I think that would be kind of a first step. Um, I have my personal view on it, which is uh, I would go the extra step. We've never talked about closing all of Main Street. We've talked about closing a block or two, as we do from time to time uh, during the year. So this weekend and beyond, we'll be looking at that very closely. I think it's not just a matter of, uh, again, where you're sitting in a restaurant. I think people need to have the, um, the perception as you walk around Main Street that it's not too crowded. And we, we have to watch that this weekend. And where we think there's a pinch point, we need to make sure it's open spaces. Last one. It seems like every time we do one of these briefings, um, I ask you questions about what do you support opening and whatnot. And then a couple hours later, the governor makes a decision to open things up, right? <laughs> well, that was in the beginning. It seemed that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, I have no idea. Um, but hair salons, you know, it seems like there's been hints that um, that, that could be next and um, gyms maybe. But let's say that that does happen, and that's another situation where it's Monday. Is the city doing anything to help um, guide those places and how to social distance? Because you have the ordinance mm -hmm. that you passed to require it which I'm not sure is enforceable, but is there, is there, are you preparing to deal with that in any way? Uh, I would say, I, I don't know what the governor's going to, what his timing is, but clearly he's been very deliberative and, and careful and cautious. I think we could say that um, last several weeks and months. And, and I do know that they're from the governor's office, uh, they're working on this testing and tracing, taking that very seriously and perhaps getting that together first. Uh, so I don't know what, when his next announcement will be. Um, and I think in terms of protocols and all, the answer is yes, we, we have played a role in, and continue to talk to our partners in the hospital systems about help assisting retailers and business people to kind of do it right. Uh, we're going to be doing more of that, I think, in the months ahead. I, I will say, on the other hand, um, some private groups have done a great job. The South Carolina Restaurant Association, I referenced a moment ago, has done a terrific job um, taking you know, nationwide resources and talking to health professionals and helping restaurants understand what their rules might be. And, and that's been very, very helpful. Uh, perhaps our emphasis may be more on the smaller retailers. I never write about when you're late, so remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Any other questions to our professionals here? More questions for you, if that's for me. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we yesterday, got all the experts here. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, we were working on some stories yesterday about the restaurants and the outdoor dining. Mm -hmm. um, most of our downtown restaurants, luckily, already have outdoor dining. But what is the city doing to help those restaurants that yeah. don't already have that option? Yeah, there's some cases of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. A couple things on that, uh, and this is not just in downtown Greenville, but everywhere. There are a number of restaurants that are not opening. That's that's one thing we, you can find out pretty quick, and we discovered that don't plan to, or at least not yet. Maybe they'll do it later. Um, but there are other restaurants that did not have outside dining opportunities. We are working with them to create downtown dining opportunities where we, where they, if they want to do that. And, and I think some of them do. So yes, we've expanded the, uh, the opportunities along the sidewalks and around the corners and, 
in public plazas, what, you know, whatever they need for, for flexibility sake. Um, you might have already touched on this a little bit, but just to elaborate, you know, it's great that all these things are opening, that we feel, you know, that we're seeing the flattening and the numbers and things yeah. of that nature. People get really excited. But I think it's also important to let people know that there is still the potential to go backwards, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's why I would, I think at this point, uh, taking this in phases, step by step, is extremely important. I uh, appreciate the comments about mask. That's an extremely important message. I think we'll be hearing more about that perhaps on a state level, uh, certainly in terms of employ in employees in stores and shops and uh, supermarket and everywhere else. They should be wearing masks. And, uh, you know, our, many of our retailers have done a fine job. I was, you know, pleased a moment ago to mention we have the new retailer opening. The name of the, comp name of the shop, by the way, is Nourish. It's on one plaza, so I'll give them a a good plug. But to all the retailers who have taken the step to reopen, um, generally the protocols have been quite good and we need to continue that, uh, that conversation. But it's still about social distancing. Uh, we can't, you know, we have to keep saying that again and again. And if, if we don't do our part, we could find ourselves taking a step backwards. Gets back to testing and tracing so we kind of can see it when it's coming. But it's extremely important to do our part on that. Um, and then just finally, I think, you know, before the governor put his stay at home, work at home order in, the city itself was passing, you know, a lot of ordinances just to kind of keep things safe, you know, in our area. Now that that's been lifted on the state level, which ordinances still stand as far as the city goes? I mean, are we still looking we, at the curfew? What's what have we heard about that still exists? Or yeah, the, exist? the one that we focus on, we have an, we have an ordinance in, in Greenville that uh, as an ordinance, it says or an order that says uh, social distancing is not just a, it's not just good advice, it is the law. <laughs> so it gives us some extra authority to go into stores and shops and other places and remind people that this is what you have to do, the people who run those businesses. So we have that little extra measure of protection in the city of Greenville. I'm not sure though that the city is any different from the county in terms of compliance. Uh, I think it's been generally pretty good, um, but it's something to, to emphasize. We, we plan to have that around a while. And, you know, another kind of changes that have been made, um, we're talking about outside dining, uh, the pickup services, the restaurants have been very creative and innovative, and that's to their credit these past several weeks and uh, on their own protocols and all too. But the, the pickup curb service, uh, we now have provisions in downtown Greenville parking spaces reserved for the pickup. I think that's one example of how things will change in the future, and that's good. We'll probably continue to have maybe into the future, my guess. Um, parking spaces reserved for, for pickup to further uh, facilitate and help the restaurants. Great, thank you. Yeah. Now who's got a good medical related question that, uh, with, the, with our experts here, come on. <laughs> Sorry, I just have a question for you, Mayor White. Um, so you mentioned some economic development projects in the pipeline earlier. Mm -hmm. I want to know what kind of impact um, COVID-19 has had on the city's operating budget as it looks at the oh, upcoming year. Yeah, on the operating budget of the city, um, we're, we're in, especially I've had some experience now in the last couple of weeks uh, talking to other mayors of other cities, and I'm pleased to tell you that we're in, the city of Greenville's in good shape. Uh, we're mainly focused on our large capital projects are having to be delayed because many of them are based on hospitality taxes, which is food and beverage tax, and that has gone down by three or four million dollars. Uh, so those are kind of on hold and projects that'll be slower to come about, if you will. They're not canceled, they're just gonna be on a slower timeline till we find out where hospitality is next year or six months or next year. But in terms of the basic services of the city, police, fire, public works, even our many, many, uh, a multitude of neighborhood improvement projects like our annual sidewalk budget, which is very important to us, traffic calming, um, a, a city parks, um, we have we're, we're looking for a budget that's going to be kind of a stay put budget we're not we're not making any reductions in those in those programs we're not laying anybody off in the police department or fire department so we're we're in a really good position in that we're, we're very strong financially so that's something we can be be uh, very happy about uh, it's just some of those longer term projects we may have to slow down so we're we're in good shape unfortunately a lot of cities are not they were their revenues fell and they had to lay people off and all that, but I'm happy to tell you we are not that way in the city of Greenville. Yeah, thank you for that question. We haven't had a chance to talk about that very much. 
been so busy with all the other, we haven't focused on the budget, but we're in, uh, we're in pretty darn good shape. Yes? Question for Dr. Osman. Good. Okay. Yes. I wondered if you could speak to more numbers. You said there was a tremendous turnout for the community testing programs. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, so we, we have had turnouts uh, between 200 and 300 individuals uh, at, at sites both in the upstate and uh, in the Midlands um, for the community testing. And we, we, we do have another testing site in the upstate here on Saturday at La Unica in Berea from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, so we, we, we've been, uh, you, you know, I think um, very pleased, and, and I hope Dr. Traxler and, and DHEC are, are pleased with that level of turnout as well. A uh, bit of an odd question. I've heard several letter writers, people who use the snail mail as correspondence, have been refraining um, from, you know, spending a lot of time with one piece of paper, touching it, breathing on it, and then sending it somewhere else. Um, what would your comments be to them as far as that's a good idea, keep doing that, or no, it's fine to write letters? What would you say? Oh, you, you mean from a risk perspective? or Yeah, just uh, I've heard some people aren't doing that. Yeah, no, I, I I don't think there's really any risk from you know you know the mail or receiving packages. I mean that that that's ne never been borne out. I mean this is really a, a droplet spread disease. So, so the risk is is you know being coughed on or sneezed upon. You know, so once again, I, I mean I mean not to sound like a broken record, but but really wearing masks in public spaces is incredibly important at stopping the spread of this disease and social distancing um, as we enter into this weekend in particular. Um, I don't quite know how to phrase this. Whether you wear a mask or not has become <clears throat> political in a lot of ways. Um, I've heard a lot of people saying, oh, they just, they're being authoritarian. They wanna, they're just flexing power. What do you say to those people as far as that this isn't about I say, you say, they say. This is about safety, not only for them but for their neighbors. Yeah, I think it's you know you know one of the typical you know social contracts we we, we have, right? I mean, I mean we have speed limits so we don't injure others or ourselves. Uh, you know, we we restrict certain activities because they're dangerous to ourselves and, and others, and, and those are all common occurrences. And I, I think the mask has not been part of that um, from spreading illness in, in our you know, history as adults, um, but this certainly occurred in the early part of the 20th century in the United States, and you know, it was very common in, in many of the Asian Pacific countries as well. So, so I, I think it's just a personal responsibility. You know, you know, as an individual, I want to make sure that I'm not spreading anything to anyone else, and um, I, I think that's something we should do for each other. Thank you. This virus, I agree, I echo exactly what Beth just said. This virus is out there and it is real. And, you know, personally, I've had family and friends impacted. I know a lot of us have. Um, so so it, it really hits home. So we hear all the different theories and conspiracy theories, but, you know, in our world as healthcare professionals, you see one person die from a disease, it's real. And as many people as, as we've already seen die from this disease, it's as real as it gets. So at the end of the day, we wouldn't spend all this time, you know, all the extra effort, all the extra money on PPE if this wasn't a real disease. And so, you know, when we look at those, um, honestly, it, it just aggravates us from the standpoint of we see the reality of not just the patient it affects, but the spill on effect of families who lose people to this disease or who were debilitated because they were in the hospital for so long, so long for this disease. Mayor, you want to close this out with a, a 
a message for the weekend about being socially distant as we allow folks back into the park? I, I can't add, I can't say it better than what the doctor said. And, that, and that's something, again, from our position uh, here in the city, uh, we talk to these folks all the time, and the stories, the reality of it. See, we're all, we're all at home. We're you know we're doing living our lives and going out, and we're not over at St. Francis Hospital. We're not over at, at Prisma and other places. And you see it on the news again. That's in New York. It's far away, but it's it's real here too, and the suffering that that can happen. So we're only asking people again just to be once again be mindful, wash your hands maintain social distances don't get carried away with these openings it wasn't too many weeks ago that everything we're talking about as an opening would have seemed extreme you say oh my goodness you, you can't go inside a restaurant yet you can't go anywhere you want to go in a retail store that would have seemed extreme now everything's relative um we're going wow this is this is great well it's it's still we're still under some pretty serious restrictions that again a couple weeks or months ago everyone would have thought was were very severe indeed uh, so I'd be mindful of everything they said and um, get outside, get recreation, but keep keep your distance and so we can keep the, the better things happening and continue a phased approach to opening. We're going to be careful. We're going to be cautious. We're going to be safe. Thank you very much for all of you being here today. Thank you.